Cranky Geek Fall 2022 is brought to you by Google, Spearline, Crisp, and Daily. For more information, see the links in the description. So if you were around for the last few minutes of the break, you saw we we're talking about uh, the broadcast industry uh, and, and live streaming and, and how those two are overlapping. And I'm really excited to have uh, Sergio here. Actually, was uh, you know the, the I think lead author of uh, a new standard to uh, help use WebRTC for some of those use cases, Whip and Web. So he's going to tell us all about it. I'll let you take it away, Sergio. Thanks. Hi, hello. So let's start. So let's face it: the history between WebRTC and the broadcasting world has not exactly been a love affair. Is the SDP, the DLS, and ICE has always been perceived as complex to implement. And from the WebRTC world, we have been focusing during many years in building communications services and multi-party applications. Uh, for example, when I tried to approach the FFmpeg developer community regarding WebRTC a couple of years ago, the feedback uh, I got was not very welcoming. And, it was, and in fact, I was even recommended that we should do Matroska over UDP instead. Probably if I go there and ask again now, the feedback would be something slightly different that we should do matros cover quick, but nothing has changed much in that regard. However, COVID pandemic has changed how the, the video services trends and accelerating the adoption and bringing a lot of new and exciting use cases for the low, low, low ultra low latency video, as people demanded interactivity and engagement. It didn't matter if it was for entertainment or for working from home. Suddenly, everyone, uh, every, everyone and every remote experience required us to feel uh, as if we were there in person. And we are talking about, oh, sorry. I forget to <laughs> move the slides. And when we are talking about interactivity, we are not talking about three second delay. So. In the broadcasting and streaming world, the use of hardware encoders and specialized equipment is commonplace. You have racks of encoders in which you can plug your cables, say, current room media. You have plug and play devices that you can use to ingest content into any streaming services or CDN. WebRTC can perfectly handle real-time media. In fact, it was designed for it. But when you try to plug in the external media sources for enable these misuse cases, you have a problem. By design, WebRTC does not specify any signaling protocol, leaving up to the applications to choose which is the one works best for them. This has been proven very, to be very successful for silo services, where you have full control of the clients and servers, and where interoperability and service interconnection has not been required at all. Having to implement a custom signaling protocol for WebRTC for each WebRTC services has hindered the broader adoption of WebRTC for ingestion. While some standard for signaling protocol, while some standard signaling protocols are available uh, and that can be integrated with WebRTC, for example, like SIP or XMPP, they are not designed for to be used in the broadcasting or streaming services, and there is also no sign of that option in the industry at all. RTSP, that it is uh, uh, RTP-based, and uh, maybe the closest in terms of features to WebRTC, is not compatible with, SD, with the SDP of an uh, answer model, and therefore we cannot use it. So currently, content providers still rely heavily on protocols like RTMP or SRT for ingesting media. Those protocols are not RTP-based, RTP uh, so requires media, transport, uh, media protocol translation when doing playback uh, through WebRTC, which increases the implementation complexity at the media server, and it is also likely to introduce delays. Also, media codecs uh, using those protocols tend to be very limited, um, mostly s 4 and s 5 and not always matches the media codec supported in, in WebRTC. So this requires transcoding in the engine's node, which also, again, introduces delays, degrades the media quality, and also increases the processing workload required on the server side. The goal of WIP is to be able to have WebRTC support on as many encoders and devices as possible. So we need to make it simple to implement for developers, easy to configure and manage for the end users. As uh, we only need to support the specific ingest use case, we can focus on a subset of the WebRTC functionality, only requiring to support a single unidirectional stream and no renegotiation. Um, being client server based, it has also allowed us to lower the requirement by reducing the WebRTC optionalities in this effort to make the, it easier to be adopter. 
Obviously, the protocol has to be ready for scaling and commercial deployment. So it must support some basic functionalities like authentication, load balancing, and redirection. Last, the protocol needs to be future-proof by allowing it to be extended with new functionalities. The actual protocol itself started kind of a Twitter joke, I mean, about what would be the minimum viable signaling protocol for WebRTC. It turned out that it was indeed possible to complete the full SDP offer and answer in a single HTTP request and reuse a standard HTTP mechanism to provide most of the requested features, like to authentication or load balancing. From the user perspective, we only uh, need to know and configure the URL of the, URL of the web endpoint and obtain it on the authentication token. And then the web client will perform an HTTP POST request to this URL with SDP offer and retrieve the SDP answer in the 201 response. This response will also contain the URL for the newly created web resources, which will expose the Array API to perform trickalize, ice restart, and also session teardown. The re this response could also optionally carry the Toon server URLs and credentials to prevent uh, having to configure them manual manually on the web clients. When the SDP offer and answer has been completed, the ICE and DTLS uh, sessions will be set up based on the, this exchange in negotiation, and the media will flow from the client to the media server. Uh, the SDP negotiation and the mechanism to announce supported protocol station in the 201 response. So the WIP protocol has been adopted by the IETF and in the late 2020, and it is in a very mature state. Hopefully, it will go to working group last call during the next week. So we are really close to having it as an as an RFC. While the goal has uh, has been to, to be able to have WebRTC support in as may, in as a, in as many encoding devices as possible, we had to show the, that the development cost of was worth the effort. So we started by adding support on the server side first with Millicast and now Dolby IO. And, and Janus being the first ones of our growing list of services supporting it. This has allowed us to approach several encode inverters and work with them in order to, to get with implementing in more and more devices and broadcasting tools. I will especially like to praise the GStreamer community, which has always been very friendly to WebRTC and recently has adopted WIP as a first-class citizen and are also already working on, on implementing the first version of WIP. So once we had the WebRTC in yes part covered with WIP, we started to look if there was any advantage of uh, doing the same thing uh, for the play-by-sec. And as WebRTC services don't have much probably creating a doc user experience for, how, for watching WebRTC streams, uh, neither on web or uh, native apps for mobile devices, uh, standardizing the uh, signal and playback protocol seemed that would not have as much impact as with. The obvious benefit is that it will allow to create player components that can be easily integrated in any project, as we have now, for example, for mpeg DAS or HLS. Uh, but also the DAS IF report about WebRTC also showed that there was an interesting use case that requires some kind of signaling protocol in order to be able to combine WebRTC and mpeg DAS. This could allow a user to start watching, for example, an event live in real time with WebRTC, but also to be able to watch it from the beginning with an mpeg DAS version allows to switch between the live and uh, and the live and the time suite version at any time and for example to to watch highlights or perform at, at insertion when uh, we then also realized that probably the most compelling reason for web would be to have support for WebRTC playback on devices with uh, providing the full WebRTC apis would be too complex to implement for example in in smart tvs which is a market in which WebRTC doesn't have much support today also, having both ingest and playback standardized will allow to have full interoperability between WebRTC services and with applications that are built on top of them. At the technical level, Web reuses all the mechanisms specified in Web. So, having an individual version of the specification has been really, really easy. Um, However, the playback of WebRTC streams has uh, more functional requirements than the ingest side, especially if we want to have functional parity with, uh, with MPEG DAS. This includes the multi-language support for audio tracks, remote playback control for pausing and muting, 
subtitle and live captioning, metadata for adding insertion and time codes, or client-side resolution selection. And the specification has been just presented at the ITF meeting last week, and it will hopefully be adopted by the same working group that it is working on, on with during the next weeks. And the draft is therefore in a much earlier state than WIP, but already has got some significant fraction being already adopted by and deployed by some major WebRTC provider, including us, of course. So to finish, uh, what's next in WebRTC for streaming and broadcasting? Um, while it is difficult to foresee the future, we are already seeing some trends and changes because of, uh, of WIP and web. For example, the, uh, the addition of WIP in professional encoder is allowing us to have feature available in the broadcasting world, but not commonplace in WebRTC until now. For example, like higher resolution to, we are not, uh, for example, 4K or more color depths and color sampling for like 444 or 10 and 12 uh, bits support. This will increase the media quality that will be uh, that we will be available to provide with WebRTC. And we can switch from the typical just enough conferencing quality to a true broadcast, broadcast grade quality. Also, uh, this will allow us to having access to some codec uh, and profiles like, for example, let's specify that it is not uh, they, they are not in using WebRTC today, and technologies like uh, HDR and Dolby Vision that are also not very adopted. The integration with MPEG DAS will also uh, allow to provide better viewing experiences uh, and extend the WebRTC support on devices that we, we cannot use it today. And last, and it, this is also a trend that we are seeing recently, uh, and, and quite in a lot of places, it will commoditize the WebRTC streaming and, and allowing services to implement a multi-CDN strategy, uh, which will allow to avoid the vendor locking and be able to switch, for example, between uh, to alternative providers in case there is any kind of footage in one of them, or even use different uh, providers simultaneously based on, on regional policies. So, and that's all of my presentation. I'm not sure if I have been too fast yesterday in, <laughs> in the... You, you, you were a little bit quicker than, uh, than, yeah, than yesterday. Yeah, um, you, you, cannot, you cannot ask a Spanish guy to speak faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, uh, well, yeah. Done, done lots of work with, uh, with the Spaniards. You guys are uh, very efficient in how you communicate. Uh, you, you love them. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I see one question uh, come in. Let me, let me show this. Uh, all right, from uh, from Kevin. If WEP is new, what is the advantage to existing TVs, etc., that will never support it? Well, we'll never support it or not. <laughs> the advances of WEP uh, compared to WebRTC, for example, providing a full WebRTC API is complex. I mean, some browsers are still struggling to have the full uh, version of the WebRTC APIs, uh, the WebRTC APIs. So it is probably much easier to provide a simple uh, playback support for web when you only they only have to parse the URL and implement the the media transport the media protocols uh, beneath. That it is quite easy for them and not have to provide the full WebRTC APIs. Mm -hmm. And also some of these uh, these uh, these uh, smart TVs that not provide probably an SDK, a JavaScript SDK at all. So implement it in, in the native SDKs could be complex. So I think that it can lower the the requirements to support this WebRTC playback. That it is the only thing that we need in in uh, in TVs. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you what kind of timeline do you see this? Uh taking to get implemented um i mean mm -hmm. do you see this as something just for like the newest latest tvs and you know it'll be big in several years or or do you mm -hmm. think it could happen faster I, than that in i think it will depend on what is the the adoption in the way in, in of web in the services i mean if there are no services that are implementing it or no major use cases for them the, the tvs will not have any any pressure to to implement it I mean, so we have to show that it is really worth it and people are using it. This, uh, we can also leverage the, or try to integrate it with MPEG DAS. So it is easier to, to just pass this requirement to the, to the TV manufacturer that are supporting, already supporting 
playback of MPEG DAS stream. So whatever, so I'm not sure exactly the, the, the timeline or if it, it is going to happen, but being able to allow them to have an easier path to, to, to implement it and would be for sure much easier to have it than, than just ask them to implement the full APIs and ask anyone to be able to implement their own applications. Yeah, maybe one comment from Harold, uh, set top boxes running Android TV. That's what... It will, that, yeah, it would be great, but in Android you can have a, like a, if you can have run a Android applications, it is kind of a, easy to, to have like a application that supports a WebRTC streaming, but obviously we will be able to have like predefined components that do the playback and, and, and make life easier for the developers. All right, and then uh, I see uh, how's WIP compared to similar approaches like Rush. I'm actually not familiar with that one. See another one, uh, a follow up from someone. Yeah, uh, Warp, Rush is uh, RTP is, is, over Quick too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this is WebRTC, so <laughs> I mean, Rush is just recently started to be standardized, so it may take a while until it is implemented and. And define it. For example, they have started to define how to transfer uh, video frames. So I think that in terms of functionality, they, they are in a very early stage. They will probably catch up, but I mean, it will be something that you can deploy it today and not wait uh, for some time in the future to 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 do it. That was that was good. I think uh, we'll be back in just a minute. Thank you to our sponsors, Google and WeberC.org, supporting web real-time communications. Spearline, guarantee a better customer experience by testing, monitoring, and benchmarking your voice and video communications. Crisp, Crisp's AI solution removes background noise and echo from meetings. Daily, build communications into any application. 